Okay. Uh, well, thank you to all the organizers. Um, it's a fantastic conference and it's a great pleasure to speak at it. So uh, as uh, mentioned, I'm going to talk about measurement theory for quantum fields. It's based on work with Rainer Fersch uh, originally in these papers, uh, in this paper here, uh, and uh, then followed up in work with uh, my colleague Henning Bostelman and Maximilian Rupp, who will be speaking uh, later on this morning, and also Ian Jubb, who will also be speaking uh, this morning. So uh, without further ado, um, what is the problem that I'm going to try to address? And uh, to answer this, we have to go back and think about uh, what we learned in quantum mechanics. Uh, and many of you probably took a course a little bit like the one I took, uh, where you learned something like this, that uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, observables are Hermitian operators, that when you measure a Hermitian operator, the result is one of its eigenvalues, and that immediately we have this instantaneous collapse of the state to the corresponding eigenvector of the eigenvalue you have just measured. Now, there are many problems with this uh, as an account in quantum me mechanics. Uh, and in particular, what we can see is that this collapse rule is completely incompatible with relativity, because in relativity, we know there is no such thing as uh, a simultaneous uh, surface, surface simultaneity. So we cannot have this idea of an instantaneous collapse. And since the collapse rule is incompatible with relativity, it's also incompatible with quantum field theory as well. And it is quite remarkable uh, in that light that uh, when you look at the literature, you find that the literature on quantum field theory is almost silent on the question of measurement. And moreover, the literature on quantum measurement is almost silent about quantum field theory. So these two communities have barely talked to each other, it seems, over the decades, despite uh, obvious uh, requirement to do so. Well, uh, you might ask then, how hard could it be to solve this problem? And people have tried, in fact. Uh, one notable attempt was by Raphael Sorkin back in 1993. And uh, he had the idea of trying to extend the rules of quantum mechanics essentially by hand to quantum field theory. He starts from the proposition that nobody seems to have written down what the rules of measurement are in quantum field theory, so he's just going to go ahead and do it. But he discovered something quite peculiar when you try to do that, and it can be illustrated by the following situation. Imagine three space-time regions. We'll call this one Alice's region, this one Bob's region, and this one Charlie's region. And the causal future of Alice's region intersects Bob's region, and the causal past of Charlie's region intersects Bob's region at all. So Bob is in causal contact with both of Alice and Charlie, but the way we set things up, Alice and Charlie are uh, causally disjoint regions. They have no means of causal, uh, causal communication with one another. So A can influence B, B can influence C, but A cannot influence C. But what Sorkin pointed out was that a non-selective measurement of what he regarded as a typical observable B of Bob's, this allows Charlie to determine whether or not A, Alice, has conducted a measurement. And that is a form of superluminal communication because Charlie shouldn't know anything about what Alice does. Charlie shouldn't even know that Alice is there. So Sorkin uh, then goes on to say, well, nobody believes in superluminal communication, so we must say that there's something wrong with what Bob did. Bob's measurement must somehow be impossible. And for this, we see that the extension in space and time of Bob's measurement is, in, is very important here, because if Bob was able to make a point-like measurement, then uh, the only way we could have this sort of situation is if Alice and Charlie were actually in causal contact with one another. So um, Sorkin says that Bob's measurement is impossible, but there didn't seem to be anything particularly special about Bob's measurement. And so he concludes that it's a priori unclear in quantum field theory which observables you can measure consistently with causality and which you can't. So uh, he concludes that then quantum field theory is in a pretty bad state. It doesn't seem to have any definite measurement theory. And all you can do is try to work case by case and try to figure out which sort of observables Bob can measure and which he can't. People have taken that up. Uh, here's one example, and we'll hear from Ian Job later on this morning. 
okay. Um, so I've set out the problem, and the next question is, well, what can one do about it? And uh, this is where the paper of Reiner and myself comes in. Uh, we took the following view. We didn't want to try to write down rules for quantum field theory out of our heads, as it were. Um, but what we wanted to do was uh, apply a rather more systematic approach and do that by modeling the measurement process. And the tools we used for this purpose were those of quantum field theory in curved space time that have been built up over the past 30, 40 years or so, uh, combined with ideas from quantum measurement theory. And for quantum measurement, I recommend this uh, excellent book here, uh, written by my late colleague, Powell Bush and his collaborators. This explains uh, quantum measurement, mainly in the context of quantum mechanics. And it does so by discussing what's called a measurement chain, where systems are measured by probes, and maybe those probes are measured by other things, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the idea is that you have things called measurement schemes, and those describe how system observables can be measured by making suitable measurements of the probe. And then state update rules are called uh, instruments in this approach. They're a bit like the Prouse operators some of you will have come across in quantum information theory. These give you the update rules. Um, and uh, the situation back in the, uh, when we started doing this was that this whole field of quantum measurement had hardly been applied in quantum field theory. There were a, a couple of papers, but not really very much at all. So we wanted to adapt quantum measurement theory to quantum field theory in order to get at an understanding of measurement in quantum field theory. So here's uh, the basic idea. We're going to have two theories, two quantum field theories actually, one of which we'll call the system and one of which we'll call the probe. And these two theories are coupled together in a compact region of space-time, which will always be denoted K. Now this coupling in a compact region of space-time, you should think of as a proxy for a complicated experiment. We're going to say, uh, boil down the complicated experiment into the idea that these two fields only couple together in this particular compact region K. So we're going to prepare the system and the probe at early times. They get coupled together, and at late times we measure the probe. And what we'd like to do is interpret this whole setup in the following way. We'd like to think of it as preparing the system, making some measurement of the system that's hopefully a local measurement, and emerging with some idea of an updated state. So the question is, how do we turn this messy real life situation over here into this slightly more clean and fictitious situation over here? Well, um, I want to emphasize again that there, is the, there are the two sides. We're actually working on the uh, coupled theory. That's real life, as it were. That's what actually happens. But we want to have this fictitious description of the whole process. So. Um, at this point, there is a possible objection, um, because I seem to have described measurement in quantum field theory by saying, well, you couple it to another quantum field, which means you still have the problem of measuring the second quantum field. So uh, there is this question, who measures the measurers? But I want to point out that this is nothing particular about quantum field theory. Even in classical physics, it's always the case that you measure systems by interaction with probes. So here is my cartoon. I want to measure the flow velocity of a fluid, which is moving with linear velocity u, say. Uh, so what I do is I dip a little paddle wheel in the, in the fluid because I'm a very unsophisticated experimenter. Uh, and that turns the linear velocity of the fluid into rotational velocity of the paddle wheel. So to measure the linear velocity of the fluid, all I have to do is measure the rotational velocity of the paddle. But that raises the question, how do I do that? Well, I might stick a dynamo on the paddle wheel, uh, and then all I have to do is measure the voltage across the terminals of the dynamo. But how do I do that? Well, I might connect a little circuit to the uh, poles of the dynamo, and then all I have to do is measure the current through the ammeter. But of course, you can see now that I have to say at each stage how I measure each successive probe. And there seems to be a possible infinite regress here. But I want to take a, a pragmatic attitude here that this chain is finite 
for practical purposes. And my evidence for saying that is that there are in the real world people who call themselves experimentalists and they succeed in declaring results. And these people are very successful. They get bigger grants and theorists. They win Nobel prizes and things like this. So we should take them very seriously. And I think it is very reasonable proposition about physics that somebody somewhere knows how to measure something. So the problem is not really to go up the chain, or at least one problem is not so much going up the chain. Pragmatically, we can say that that's finite. The interesting question for today is what do we learn from somewhere up in the chain about what was right at the bottom? In this case, the flow velocity of the uh, fluid. In our case, the um, something about a quantum field theory. So that's the uh, view I want to take. Uh, the other thing to say here is that here in this example, every time I change from my uh, system to the next probe, I seem to have changed which sort of physics I'm using, whether it was linear fluid mechanics or rotational dynamics or electrodynamics or electronics or whatever it might be. There's a slight difference when we're talking about quantum field theory because it claims to be a fundamental theory or fundamental at certain scales. So everything higher up at, at uh, bigger scales is presumably built out of things that can be described by quantum field theory. So to understand the measurement chain, I think that the fundamental thing to understand is the relationship between one quantum field and another one which is probing it and how you get information from one to the other. So that's the spirit in which we're going to proceed. Now, I'm definitely not going to minimize the whole uh, measurement problem in quantum mechanics. There is a real problem, which is how to understand why quantum measurements result in the registration of definite results as opposed to only ever seeing superpositions. That's challenging and worthwhile, but it's just not what I'm going to talk about today. And I do not claim to have solved it either. So how does the system that I'm going to describe actually work? Well, um, we're both, we're going to describe the system and probe as quantum field theories. They're going to live on a space time M, which is going to be globally hyperbolic. And um, very much as in Bob Wall's talk yesterday, I'm going to use the algebraic approach to quantum field theory. So theory A on space time M is going to be described using an algebra of observables. And uh, more specifically, uh, if I look at a little region N within my space time, I can ask about the um, elements of this algebra that are localizable in that region N. And that will be denoted in this way here, AM semicolon N. So uh, a typical element of this local algebra would include something like the smeared field that Bob Wald had yesterday. So we imagine uh, integrating a field against some test function, which vanishes outside the region N. That would be a sort of cartoon version, if you like, of an element of the local algebra. But something to emphasize is that in Bob's talk, he restricted himself to the theory of the uh, linear scalar field. Um, and uh, that was, of course, exactly what he wanted in his uh, talk. Here I'm taking a broader view on algebraic quantum field theory, uh, which is essentially that any quantum field theory worthy of the name can be described using algebras of observables uh, and subject to a small number of clearly stated assumptions. So this is the general framework. It doesn't tie us to particular models uh, of quantum field theory. And I'm going to try to proceed in a way which is going to maintain model independence as far as possible. So what we're going to do is compare two things. If I've got theory A and theory B, I can essentially lay them alongside each other without making any interactions between them at all. This is, if you like, the uncoupled combination of the two theories. And in terms of the algebras, it would be described by taking the local algebra for theory A in region N, the local algebra for theory B in region N, and just forming a tensor product. Okay, so that should give me my local algebra for uh, region um, N in the uncoupled theory. On the other hand, we want to say that these two theories can be 
uh, made to couple with one another in this compact region K. So there will be another theory, which is going to be a quantum field theory in its own right, uh, described by an algebra obeying the rules of algebraic quantum field theory. This is going to be called C, the coupled combination. Now, um, I haven't said anything about what theory A and theory B are. They don't. I haven't given Lagrangians or anything like that. So you might think it's quite difficult to say how to couple them together. So what we do is we make very minimal assumption on what C should be like. Uh, and the idea is that we say that outside the causal hull of our coupling region K, so take any region L that's outside that causal hull, like this one down here, the local algebra for the coupled theory should just be isomorphic to the local algebra for the uncoupled theory. In other words, this coupling only is operative inside the region K in its causal hull. But there's an important aspect to this. It sounds like a technicality, but it's actually the, the thing that makes it all work. That the system of isomorphisms we get, one for each region L outside the causal hull, these have to be compatible with one of the main rules of algebraic quantum field theory, which is called isotony. And that's simply the idea that if you increase the size of a region from little L from L to N, where L sits inside N, then the algebras should nest inside one another. And um, this means that the isomorphisms between um, uh, uh, the, the um, coupled theory for region L and the uncoupled theory for region L and the same for region N in this case, they have to be related in a particular way to make this work. And that is actually uh, a large part of what makes this whole uh, system that I'm about to describe actually work. Okay, so that's our minimal assumption. And then we can use um, two things. We use the fact that we're in a globally hyperbolic space time, which means that we know quite a lot about its geometry and causal structure. And we combine that with some of the basic assumptions of algebraic quantum field theory, in particular, something that's called the time slice axiom. And this gives us some isomorphisms between the full uncoupled algebra, this is on the whole space time, and the full coupled algebra on the full space time. So let's see how that works. Okay, so here's our coupling region K. I can uh, cut out the causal future of this region K. And that leaves me with a region M minus, which is a globally hyperbolic space time in its own right. It's a perfectly decent region within M. And it also contains a Cauchy surface for the whole of the space time. Uh, and uh, because of that, if I know the algebra for region M minus, I should know the algebra for the whole space time. That's the time slice axiom. But now reflect that region M minus is outside the causal hull of region K. So the coupled and uncoupled theories are isomorphic for this region M minus. And that means, since they both obey the time slice axiom by assumption, that there is an isomorphism between the uncoupled theory and the coupled theory at early times. This is going to be Tor minus. And it comes just from what I've told you there, these ideas about global hyperbolicity and the time slice property. So of course I can do the same by cutting out the causal past of the region K. That gives me a region M plus, I play the same game and I get another isomorphism, Tor plus, which reflects an identification between the coupled and uncoupled theories at late times. Okay, so I've got these two isomorphisms. I can of course put them together and I can cross from the uncoupled to the coupled theory at late times and then undo the identification but using the early time map that gives me an isomorphism from the uncoupled theory to itself and that's going to be denoted theta it's an automorphism that means an isomorphism of u to itself and we call it the scattering operator okay so now proceeding um, the idea with measurement is to prepare early and measure late. You can try doing it the other way around, but you probably won't win many Nobel Prizes doing that. And we're going to use these Tor plus and minus maps 
uh, as a translation device, as a dictionary, to translate the fictitious uncoupled language about the uncoupled combination of a system and probe to what actually happens in the laboratory where they are coupled together. Okay, let me give you an example of some uncoupled language. So here's a statement you might make. We start the experiment by preparing the system and probe in states omega and sigma at early times. Well, you don't actually have experimental access to the system and probe separately. What you have access to is this couple theory. That's the one that is actually there in the real world. So what you actually mean when you make a statement like this is that we must do something to the couple theory, but it somehow has to reflect the meaning of this statement. And uh, the translation is the following. Um, if we really did have the system and probe separately, we could prepare the uncoupled combination in a state omega tensor sigma. So there's our system state, there's our probe initial state. So there is the a state on the uncoupled combination that corresponds to that uh, combination of states. Well, the corresponding state on the coupled theory, I'm going to denote uh, by omega sigma tilde. Um, and uh, this is going to be an identification made using the map tor minus, the identification at early times. Uh, I'm not going to write down the formula for that, but it's, it's easy to do. Here's another fictitious statement. We measure a probe observable B at late time. Well, you don't have access to the probe theory by itself. What you can only access is this coupled theory, but at late times. So what we do is we uh, make the following uh, translation. If we did have access to the system and probe in the uncoupled theory, we would, of course, naturally look at the observable uh, unit tensor B. That would be the uh, I, I analog of measuring a probe observable B at late times. But we've only got access to the coupled theory so we translate from the uncoupled to the coupled theory using our identification at late times, which is tor plus. So here we get an observable B tilde, uh, which is just done by mapping across using tor plus. Okay, and the, the formula up here is essentially mapping across um, using the inverse of the dual map of tor minus, which is why I didn't want to write down the, the formula. Now we come to the actual experiment. This is actually performed on the couple theory. We actually measure observable B tilde in this state omega sub tilde um, sigma. This is what we actually do. We wish to interpret the results back in terms of our fictitious system. So uh, we interpret this as a fictitious measurement of some induced system observable. And we want to say, that this, uh, should, this fictitious measurement should take place in the original system state omega. How do we make the translation in this case? Well, we demand that the expectation values should match up. So what we're interested in finding is an observable of the system A such that its expectation in the original system state is equal to the expectation value of the actual observable of the coupled theory that we actually performed in this state of the couple theory. Okay, that's what we're looking for. And assuming that there is such a thing, I'm going to denote it by epsilon sub sigma of B. So this reflects the fact that it depends not only on the observable B of the probe, but also of the probe preparation state sigma. Okay. Now, in fact, uh, you can give explicit formulae for this induced system observable uh, epsilon sub sigma of B. And uh, it depends not only on B, but also sigma and the scattering uh, map uh, theta. Okay, so it really does depend on the way that the system and probe are coupled together. And even better than that, uh, these explicit formulae can be worked out and computed in specific models. And I'll come to an example of that uh, in a minute or two. What are the properties of these induced observables then? What are we actually learning about the system when we measure the probe? Well, you can prove several things. One is that these induced observables always can be localized in any suitable neighborhood 
of the coupling region K. So this was something that we, we had an open mind about when we started this work. It was unclear to us, for example, whether the induced observable of uh, induced system observable would live in the region where you measure the probe, for example. But it doesn't. It lives in the region where the system and the probe are coupled together. And this is an important thing. So you really uh, are measuring localizable observables, local observables of the system, when you make any measurement of the probe. That's an important point. It doesn't matter at all where what the localization of this of this observable B is of the probe. Um, the induced observable is something localized uh, in the coupling region or just around around it. That's one thing you can learn. You might also say, well, what happens if you do measure a probe observable that is localizable in a space in a region that is space like separated from K? So. In other words, it shouldn't know what the coupling is or even that there was some coupling there. Well, you can compute what the induced probe, the, what the induced system observables uh, are in this situation, and they turn out to be trivial. They're just multiples of the unit. You can't learn anything from uh, them at all about the system. So that's good. We shouldn't be able to find out about something that's going on in K using a probe observable that's space-like separated from K. So that's a, a nice consistency check. Another very important point to mention is that the induced observables we get in this way are typically unsharp. This is very important. Uh, even if you were to start with a projective measurement of the probe, this observable here, this induced one, would be a not would be a positive operator, but it is not a projection. And this is very typical in quantum measurement theory. Um, projective measurements are really not at all a generic feature of the game. What's much more uh, likely to be going on are unsharp measurements, and this we see here. Anytime you go along a measurement chain, almost uh, always generically, you're going to get a um, a, a, a non-projective measurement coming out at the, at the system level. And uh, related to this is that if you look at the induced observable and you ask what its variance is in the uh, initial system state, okay, so that's this variance here, uh, it is always less than or equal to the variance of the actual measurement that we made on the coupled theory. And this is, again, to be expected, it is detector noise. This is where the detector noise lives, okay? It's, uh, we've sort of idealized it out, if you like, uh, when we go down to the, um, to the uh, system-only fictitious story. Remember, of course, that the expectation values of these two things were, uh, by uh, construction, equal to one another, but the variances uh, are in this relation here. The variance of the real thing is always greater than or equal to the variance of the fictitious thing in the system. So I promised you a specific model, and here it is. Uh, I'm going to take two free scalar fields of the sort that Bob Wall described yesterday afternoon, and um, I'm going to call one of them phi, and that will be my system field, and the other one psi, and that will be my probe uh, field. And I, I think you all know what the Lagrangians of the free scalar fields are, so I haven't written them down. And what I have written down is the interaction term between the two theories. And it's going to be very simple. It's just this um, coupling here, rho times phi times sigma, times psi rather, I beg your pardon. And rho here is a smooth, compactly supported function. So it's switched off everywhere except in some compact set K. So that's the uh, setup uh, we have. Here's the interaction term. Um, I've rigged it actually so that the combined theory, when you have this interaction switched on, is still actually a free quantum field theory. So there's no doubt about how we quantize it. And then, um, because everything is uh, nice and simple and we can actually uh, construct all of our quantum fields in this situation, we can actually compute what is the induced system observable corresponding to um, smeared fields in the probe. So smearing, there's a smeared field, psi smeared with H. And it is most convenient, actually, to express everything in terms of 
formal power series. So when I write an exponential here, um, you really think of this as, as a formal power series uh, in, uh, if you like, in powers of H, uh, this test function uh, here, which is supposed to be localized um, in the out region, this M plus region. And if we do that, we find a really rather uh, nice identity. Um, here I've got um, the induced observables applied to this formal power series, e to the i psi h. Um, and uh, it comes out, by the way, there seems to be a, a troop of um, a school party going past the window. So do let me know if there's too much noise on the, on the line and I'll, I'll shut the window. Um, but um, if uh, what we get here is another formal power series in powers of another smeared field. Now this is a smearing of the, um, of the uh, system field phi against some uh, test function f minus. Now f minus uh, lives in the intersection of the causal past of our test function h intersected with the support of our uh, coupling uh, constant, our variable coupling constant rho. Okay, so um, F minus lives in this part of the diagram here. And there's another test function. You, you find all of this out by, um, uh, by doing classical PDEs, essentially. There's another test function, H minus. And the difference between H minus and our original test function H is also supported in this region down here. Okay, so we know where these test functions f minus and h minus live, uh, and we get this identity, as I say. So here we have a formal power series uh, in powers of f minus, and here we have another formal power series, uh, which also involves the, um, cis the probe field smeared against this h minus and expectation value in the uh, probe preparation state. Okay. So I said all of this is a uh, formal power series, and, and what that means is you just expand, okay? And then you identify things that are at the same order in the uh, expansion. So the, uh, here we go. The simplest, of course, is uh, at zeroth order. We just have the identity here. We have the identity here. We have the expectation value of the identity there as well. So uh, that gives us one uh, when we plug it into sigma. And so we just get, the unit coming out. So uh, this is actually a general fact that the unit uh, always maps to the unit. The unit of the probe gets mapped to the unit of the system. At the next order, what we discover is the following identity, that if I take a smeared field, so smearing up here, um, I uh, will find uh, this object here. I get a smearing of the system field against F minus, which you remember was living in here, plus a contribution which is a multiple of the unit. And that is related to uh, a smearing of the probe field in the probe preparation state. So if you've been careful to uh, make sure that the uh, one point function vanishes as you would if you used a Gaussian state like uh, Bob was doing yesterday at certain points, this term wouldn't be there at all. But in general, um, not all states are Gaussian and so this term might actually be there. And at the second order, uh, if I take the square of the smeared field, I get the square of the field I had here, but some extra stuff. And from this, you can see that this map at psi on sigma is not a homomorphism. It doesn't map the square of psi h to the square of phi f minus. Um, there is extra junk. Uh, and again, we see a multiple of the unit, this time, it's actually got the expectation value of the squared field. So even if your one point function vanished, this two point function would normally uh, be there. Generically, it's non-zero, strictly positive. And therefore, uh, we do see some extra terms here. We also have another term, which again involves the one point function of the preparation state. And in this case, it's multiplying uh, the field uh, phi smeared against f minus. Okay, so that's what we have here. As I say, you might have chosen a Gaussian state, this term would be absent, this term would be absent, but you would still nonetheless have an additional contribution. And this is the origin of this increased variance 
that I, I was uh, mentioning. This is really about detector noise that comes from the state sigma. Okay, so that's an example of uh, some of these uh, induced observables. We see it can be worked out quite concretely in, uh, in this model at least. So, so much for observables. And uh, the next thing is to go on and talk a bit about states. Um, and we want to take the following approach, okay? Our, our question is, how do we um, take the instantaneous collapse rule from quantum mechanics and make it into something that is uh, reasonably sensible in quantum field theory in curved space-time? Well, of course, you, you could scratch your head and, and try to come up with something, um, but it's much better to take an operational rule, an operational viewpoint, and focus on what the purpose of state updates is anyway, okay? And uh, the purpose of state updates is to be able to make predictions about what will happen. So you make one measurement, you see what, what, what the outcome was, you then want to be able to make further predictions about further measurements, okay, that haven't happened yet. So uh, let's analyze this in the following way. We're now going to have two probes, A and B. And uh, for simplicity, let's suppose that they each measure something uh, called an effect, which is a special sort of observable that will only give you the answer true or false, okay? Remember, this need not be a projection. It will generally be a positive operator bounded between zero and the unit. Anyway, that's a, a true-false measurement. And uh, we're going to measure both of A and B. Now, here's a, a question, uh, which I claim to be a, a, an interesting scientific question. Suppose you measure A and you get the value true coming out. Here's the question, what is the probability that we will get the value true coming out of the measurement of B? Okay, so that is a question that it might be interesting to know the answer for. Um, and it seems to me to be a subsidiary question to ask, can we express this probability using another state? Okay, if so, we might think of this as a state that's been updated to take into account the fact that we got this measurement true from A, okay? But this is the question we're really interested in. And this one seems to be kind of subsidiary to me. And maybe it wouldn't work out that we can. But actually, if we work within the framework that I've described, uh, it all does work out. So in the following way, well, firstly, we can think of these two probes, A and B, as being a sort of combined super probe, just the two of them together. And we're going to combine those two true-false measurements into uh, a single true-false measurement, which is their logical conjunction, success of both measurements, okay? And that effect uh, is actually described by the tensor product of A and B, okay? So that's going to be our uh, setup. And we now have a single probe, the super probe uh, to describe. And we already know quite a lot about how to, how to describe single probes in this theory. And it is a theorem uh, that uh, if the coupling region for our A probe and the coupling region for our B probe can be separated by a Cauchy surface, that's what this little cartoon here means, and we have a very natural property called causal factorization, which simply means that the overall scattering matrix for the two evolutions together can be factored as the B scattering matrix followed by the A scattering matrix. Remember, by the way, that our scattering matrix was defined by the future identification and then undoing the past identification. So it's natural that the later one comes first here in this factorization. So if we have this situation and there is a causal factorization property on the overall evolution, then we can compute a conditional probability for uh, a successful measurement of B conditioned on the successful measurement of A. And this is a purely classical probability formula, the, the formula for 
conditional probability. So this much is just ordinary probability theory. And then we can say, well, uh, now we just need to know what the expectation value of the, um, uh, th th this uh, combined super probe is. Okay, we need to know what that expectation and, and this probability is. And it is a theorem that this can be expressed as an expectation value of the observable B, the later one, in another state. And this state, omega A, uh, can be given uh, quite explicitly by a formula here. All right, so quite a lot of symbols. Here is the early effect A, you say. There is the scattering map for our early observation, the, the way we measure A. Here is going to be some observable C, which we want to compute the expectation. Finally, here is the state, the system state. Significantly, there is nothing about the probe B in here. We don't have B or sigma B or theta B in there. So this is totally determined by the way we conducted the measurement of A. And as I say, it is a theorem that this conditional probability can be given as this expectation value in this updated state, omega sub A. So we can think of this as an updated state, which is consequent on successful measurement of A. And emphasis, it depends on how we measured our uh, effect A. Now, an important point is that it is not actually necessary to assume that the actual state of the real world actually changes, right? So we're not going to have a, an instantaneous collapse rule at all. What's going on here is that this update rule is purely bookkeeping. It's doing accountancy for you. And what it's doing is computing this conditional expectation value, given the additional knowledge from the A measurement. So you don't have to do this at all. You can do your data analysis much later on in the game. But if you want to just have a simple way of proceeding now, knowing that the A measurement came out true, then you can use the state omega A. Okay. So what uh, properties uh, does this have? Well, it satisfies some important consistency conditions. Um, take two updates at space-like separation. Well, then, of course, it's never clear which one of them should go first. And in, uh, the good news is it doesn't matter. If we update state using the B measurement and then the A measurement or the other way around, we get the same updated state. So that's important. And also, if you assume this causal factorization in a suitably extended way, um, and you have a whole bunch of probes, a, effects, A1, A2, up to AN, and you look at the expectation value of another one, AN plus one, this expectation value can be expressed as the expected value of AN plus one in a state which has been successively updated using A1, A2, and so on to AN, provided that we can um, measure these effects using um, probes that can be set into some causal order, so each separated from Cauchy surfaces from the next one, that's what this um, funny uh, notation here means. And moreover, this equality is valid for any compatible causal ordering, because if two of these uh, pro effects here were at space-like separation, again, you could swap them around uh, and it would still be a valid causal ordering of all of the probes. So that's two very important uh, consistency uh, relations. And uh, we pass now to um, the situation where we make no selection on the results of A. And in this case, uh, our updated state will be a convex combination of the state we get if we did measure A to be true and the state we get if we did measure A to be false, weighted by the probability of occurrence. Again, you can compute what this state is. I'm going to put NS for non-selective as a superscript. And there's a formula here for the expectation value of any observable C of the system in this updated non-selective state. We see that it depends on uh, theta A and sigma A, but not on A itself, not on the actual effect, just on the way that it was measured, which is interesting. 
And we can extend this to, again, uh, multiple causally orderable probes, which can be put into a causal order like this. We've got, as it were, Team Alice, all of the A probes. We've got Team Charlie, a whole bunch of C probes. And we've got Bob in the middle. And uh, suppose we measure all of the Alice probes, all of the Charlie probes, uh, non-selectively. And we can ask, well, what is the expected value of Bob's observable in the initial system state? And there's a formula for that. You compute it. And it turns out that it is the expectation whoops, in the uh, successively updated state using non-selective updates, using all of the Alice probes in uh, any valid causal order, but not the future ones. So again, very important. Um, current events depend on past ones, but they do not depend on future ones. So there's no retrodiction in this uh, whole framework. Also good news. So further results that uh, indicate we're on the right track, I give you two theorems. Um, you might ask, well, what happens if we uh, look at the uh, effect of this uh, updated state on an observable that is localizable, space-like, to our coupling region for, uh, say, the, the first observable, A. And if we are making a non-selective measurement, we have what I call the principle of blissful ignorance. It's a theorem, uh, which says that the expectation value in the updated state, non-selectively, of B is the same as it always was. And this is right because B should not know that uh, the A measurement was there or it took place. No record of it exists because it was, it was non-selective. And so this is quite right. B should be in blissful ignorance of uh, what happened uh, with, say, Alice's measurement. But what about selective updates? And here, again, we can compute everything. And you might again ask, well, can it happen that um, the expectation value of this space-like separated observable is the same uh, um, in the original state as it is in the updated state? And you can check that this happens if and only if our observable B is uncorrelated with the induced system observable corresponding to A in our initial state. In other words, this is what I call unspooky action at a distance. It simply is revealing correlations that there were in the initial state. I often uh, illustrate this using an example of uh, uh, two envelopes. One of them contains a red postcard. The other contains a blue postcard. They're sent to different places, maybe one to York and one to Madrid, say. Um, in Madrid, they open the envelope and they find the blue postcard. They know that the York postcard must be red. There's no superluminal communication involved in this. It is simply revealing a correlation in the initial state. And that is what we see here. So again, this is exactly these two um, uh, properties, which are theorems of this whole measurement scheme, are exactly what you would like to have uh, to understand the relationship with causality. So now um, let's come back to uh, one of these motivating examples, which was impossible measurements. So here we go with the uh, setup again uh, for Sorkin's measurement. By the way, Sorkin actually sometimes talked about a, a, a slab, the B could extend over a slab. So this is a sort of boiled down version where we focus on what's really essential, which is that there is uh, some region that overlaps A, the causal future of A and the causal past of C. OK, so as I said at the beginning, uh, the setup is that Alice is going to choose whether or not to make a non-selective measurement. Bob is going to make a non-selective measurement. And the question is, can Charlie tell whether or not Alice made a measurement? We can now write this in the following notation. Um, here is the expected value of Charlie's observable if uh, Alice didn't measure. So we only have the non-selective update from Bob is that equal to uh, the expectation of Charlie's observable when we non-selectively update for both Alice and Bob making measurements? OK, so there's the question. And now we just compute both sides. This was in, in this paper with uh, uh, Henning and Maximilian. Uh, we measure the A and B, model the A and B measurements using uh, probes in the way I've described. 
And then um, we have to analyze the geometry of the situation and really focus on the locality of the scattering maps that, come, that, that are used in this process. And effectively what happens is that the scattering map for Bob's observable maps Charlie's observable into something that can be localized in this region N. And that is space-like to A. And the reason it's space-like to A is precisely the same reason that Alice is out of causal contact with Charlie, okay? And Alice, of course, and uh, non-selective, sorry, uh, and, and of course, at space-like separation, you can't tell whether a non-selective measurement has occurred. So uh, this is essentially the reason behind the theorem we proved, which is that Charlie cannot determine whether Alice is measured. In other words, these two expectation values are always the same. So um, our measurement scheme then has no pathologies of the type that Raphael Sorkin pointed out back in 1993. What underlies that is the key assumption that our probes are described by local physics and so are the couplings between our probe theory and our system theory. So if you turn it around, the only way you could make an impossible measurement would be if you had some probes or coupling that did not respect locality. So impossible measurements can only be performed using impossible apparatus, which is good news. So what actually was problematic in Sorkin's original description was the update rule that he wrote down. That is what caused the trouble. And so one message from this, which I think we'll hear rather more about in, in Maximilian's talk, is that not all elements of a local algebra induce local updates, things that could be uh, produced by local physics. So I think that's one of the key messages. Now you might still worry about Sorkin's setup um, because I've shown you that the uh, observables that are measured by measurement schemes um, are free from these pathologies. But of course you might ask, well, which ones are? Which ones are free of these pathologies? And again, um, essentially all of them is the answer for which Maximilian's talk will uh, give you the details, at least in one model. And so coming now towards my conclusion, um, I would say that we have resolved all of the problematic aspects of the original impossible measurement uh, description. Okay, our measurement schemes are free of Sorkin type pathologies and all local observables can be measured using, well, perhaps sequences of such measurement schemes. Now that doesn't mean that there's no interest left in these Sorkin, uh, in the Sorkin uh, setup, because there is still an interesting question, which is which elements of local algebras do induce causality respecting operations, okay? So there's an interesting question, but I would claim that it is not a fundamental problem in measurement theory. It is a still, it's an interesting and important question about local algebras, but it's not a problem anymore. For this, uh, then I think we will wait for Ian's talk. And so now I can summarize. Um, I have shown you that um, quantum field theory uh, has a consistent system of measurement schemes and update rules. It's consistent with relativity, with curved space times. We can have multiple observers. Importantly, ignorance is protected in all the right places. You cannot learn about anything you shouldn't. There are no impossible measurements, uh, which as it should be. And an important thing here is that it was based on quantum field theory itself using minimal and general assumptions from the theory with no additional input. So um, outlook um, is, well, obviously what can one do with it? Uh, can we use this for quantum info? And uh, one uh, approach to that is in another paper of Maximilian's. We can also look further up the measurement chain. There's an awful lot of work on Unruh DeWitt detectors, and we'll hear something about that today as well. Um, but uh, I would actually like to model a real device from the viewpoint of quantum field theory. I think that would be a very interesting challenge. And uh, my perhaps provocative end uh, statement is the following, that quantum field theory, uh, I believe, has the answers to all of these questions. Uh, and the problem is sometimes getting the questions right. So uh, with that, I will thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much for, for your talk. Um, do we have any questions? Yes, thanks for such a wonderful talk. I have a very basic question. Uh, maybe I didn't catch it, but uh, uh, exactly how in this protocol, how do you transform this quantum measurement in classical information? Let's say in bits, one and zeros, because I didn't, uh, sorry. Yeah, so um, what is left unresolved by all of this is how you actually get classical information out of the quantum field theory. That I, I say is the, as it were, the measurement problem uh, in, in quantum theory. I'm not resolving that. So I am taking the viewpoint, as I said, that, that somebody somewhere knows how to measure something that seems to be kind of prerequisite for doing science. Um, but given that that happens, I want to understand what we learn from that down at the chain. Okay, so I'm not minimizing the issue of how you get from a, a quantum theory to classical information or something that could be described using classical information. Not at all. That's a difficult problem. But um, what I want to understand is what we can learn about quantum field theory and, and in particular, what are the rules of, of, quantum, uh, of quantum measurement theory for quantum fields? Okay, so the output is sort of another quantum state instead of classical. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so what we get is we we learn if if you're able to measure uh, some observable of the probe quantum field theory, you are learning information about the system theory, it's localized information about it, and you can even proceed uh, making uh, an update. Okay, an updated state, which builds in the information that you accumulated from this from this measurement. Okay, that that's the that's the uh, uh, the viewpoint, right? So we've got a good measurement theory for quantum field theory. We still have the problem, the overall problem of, of measurement in in quantum theory. Okay, that's not gone away. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Gerda, for your question. And uh, Dan, please go ahead. Yes. Hi. Hi, Chris. Hi. Nice, nice talk. Um, I just had a quick question. So uh, the models that have been considered, or at least the model that you consider as a sort of, uh, let's say, test case of, of your um, of this of of this uh, measurement schemes, um, uh, that was still a linear model, right? So that gives you sort of linear equations of motion for both phi and psi. Am I right in saying that? I think we we lost. Uh, yeah, I think we lost Chris. Uh, oh dear. Um, yeah, it seems so. I will. Uh, um, yeah, let's see if we can if we recover uh, him in a couple of minutes. Hi, right. sorry, oh, I, I don't perfect. know quite what happened there. Did I drop out or did, did other people drop out? Uh, yes, you, you, you did. You did. Yeah. Okay, right. I think it was a problem in your. Oh, other people dropped out as well. Oh, awesome. Um, okay, sorry, Dan. Um, the the critical point of your um, question got lost in all of that. Yes. So, am I right in saying that the models you you uh, you looked at were still linear uh, models? They they were. Yes. So they were two linear fields with this linear coupling. So it's by linear term in the in the interaction. Yeah. yeah. So uh, is it also possible to go to, let's say, a, a perturbative uh, QFT approach to these, to these measurement yes. schemes? Has that been yes. worked out? Or? Absolutely, but that hasn't been fully worked out. There, are, there is some preliminary work, but uh, th this is not yet done. But there's certainly no obstruction. OK, thanks. Thank you for your question. Uh, Jose, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So, well, in, I think the kind of measurements that Sorkin was considering um, don't involve that much using, a, say, a POVM on the pro, but the, declaring that you have a POVM over 
a set of different dynamics, right? So imagine that they have a double slit experiment. And what I do is I put a detector somewhere that is correlated by, uh, with the position of a particle. Then I move my detector around and that effectively gives you different uh, dynamical situations. In this language, I think that would mean uh, different scattering morphisms, right? Then I measure the detector click and then I interpret that I measure the position of the particle because the detector clicked and the detector only clicks when the, say the, the particle transits through the close up spaces that have to do with the position of the detector, right? Um, so have you think in these lines on, well, of course this obviously cannot be extended to several measurements. So that's the reason why you cannot assign probabilities to histories in the history formulation. But have you, have you thought um, in, on the question of whether one can assign uh, measures to different dynamics? Uh, say, for instance, if you could have some notion of uh, uh, having a measure over different interaction regions. Um, no, I think is the is the simple answer to that. I'd have to actually think a bit what how that would actually work. So you actually, uh, so so you wish to consider a space of possible dynamics of possible couplings, and then put a measure on that. that is that the idea? And then and then uh, and the reason for that is because you're not perfectly sure which measurement is actually occurring is that the idea or um uh, yeah, yeah well that they, you need to interpret the what you're actually measuring right so the only way in which you interpret what you're measuring is by actually uh, fleshing out the dynamics right yeah uh, well i mean in some situations for instance if you do this thing with a detector uh, and you couple in a certain way in the <clears throat> double slit experiment setup in a quantum mechanical setup, basically, if you couple to the spectral projections of the position, you can actually uh, use this framework and get uh, the usual update rule for the, um, uh, the there is like the textbook update rule. So I guess that what happens here is that uh, in this setup, in quantum theory, you cannot uh, actually put a measure over different dynamics uh, because uh, doing that uh, would uh, violate the dynamics somehow. So I was thinking, uh, just like uh, wondering if uh, the uh, there is there would be uh, like I don't know some sort of uh, insight on uh, whether you can take a, say, like a morphism value the measure and see how that would work out. Maybe, I, I guess I, I would I would have to think, give some thought to, to exactly what's proposed there, yeah. <laughs> well, just like a comment and like maybe you uh, yeah. thought about it because that, that would be the, the way in which you would re actually recover the, the typical measurements in quantum mechanics in a quantum mechanical setup. And oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, no, okay, I beg your pardon. Right, I thought, yeah, yeah. No, I mean we certainly do have what what we call effect valued measures. So, so this, uh, I, yeah, I, I misunderstood what you were getting at when you were talking about different dynamics, but uh, one can certainly have a whole um, system of these effects, and and that can form a, a, uh, an effect valued measure, if you like, it gives you a, a positive operator valued measure. So absolutely, yes, that's in the, that's in the paper with Reiner. Yeah, so, uh, so I didn't, I didn't. I, yeah, no, 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 but I think I meant, yeah, no, I mean, so uh, for instance, if uh, you do a double measurement in your framework, the probabilities are uh, additive in both the measurements, uh, the uh, first effect value measure that you're measuring and the second effect value measure that you're measuring, the detector that it drags after, right? Mm -hmm. So that gives you a joint probability measure by construction. Yes. We can have so the thing, is that, uh, the thing is that the thing is that the so in in some fields 
like uh, it is discussed, uh, for instance, I think Sorkin uh, uh, basically claims that uh, one cannot have this, uh, how to put this, um, joint probability measures in, in quantum theory overall, because the measures are not additive. So I think in your framework, the way in which you actually okay. recover that notion is not by uh, doing effect that, and not considering the, pro the joint probability distributions over the outcomes of the detectors, but what happens if you consider a priori that you have an uh, effect valued measure generated by some dynamics over different, uh, for instance, if you place the interaction in different places, and what happens if you do that twice, then if you try to associate to the joint, uh, a joint probability measure to put in one detector in one place and a second detector in another one, that cannot give you uh, uh, an additive uh, probability measure over space time of your, the space of functions in which uh, you use to interact. Yeah. Okay, I, th I think this is um, kind of, it would, would take a lot of digging into it. And I think it's actually yeah yeah yeah, yeah okay. You, but, but anyway, thank you for the comment. Uh, thank you. No, no question. Uh, so please on everyone the, the the last question. Uh, if, if if you make make it short. Uh, yeah sure. Uh, hi Chris. Uh, thanks hi, for the nice talk. Yeah. Uh, nice. So I was wondering since in this framework your probe is also a quantum field. So when we are writing the interaction, don't you need any uh, additional condition on the probe field for the product to be well defined, like Hurman de Trajurian satisfied or something? Well, so in the general framework, everything is done uh, in this algebraic framework. So I don't actually need to specify uh, the details of the coupling, merely that the couple theory should be an, an AQFT. Okay, so that, that should mm -hmm. be a sensible theory in its own right. That's, that's the important thing. In the, in the specific model, of course, I set it up so that it's, it's a good local interaction. So if I was, if I, um, as Dan was suggesting, do some, something more perturbative, well, I would make sure that the terms in the Lagrangian were Wick squares or, or, or something like this. Okay. So, you know, one, one could actually, um, you, you would just formulate a decent looking quantum field theory. The only thing you would do is uh, insert this um, coupling uh, constant, this rho, uh, which is uh, switched off outside some compact region. So the coupling is, is localized. But otherwise, you would just write down any interaction between quantum fields that you that, that would ordinarily make sense as a make, give you a local quantum field theory. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah.